So everybody say, hi, Jay. Hey, Jay. Hey, Jay. Hey. <laughs> All right, we're in Hebrews chapter three tonight as we continue on in our outline. We're going to be looking this week and next week at the second warning that the book of that the author of the book of Hebrews issues. There's four warnings in the book of Hebrews. You talked about one while I was away back in chapter two. Uh, we're going to be beginning a, another one tonight and on through chapter four. So let's open your Bibles to chapter three. And somebody go ahead and read that. It's not a very long chapter. Read it for us nice and loud and then we'll take a look at the questions for tonight. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appeared, appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house, for he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years, therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways, and I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoke me. For who hath provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses, and with whom I he and with whom was he hangry? Hangry. Hangry. <laughs> I get that later. And with whom he was angry for four Man years. Do that to you. I, I, do that to you. Man, will do that to you. That's for sure. <laughs> Make you angry. <laughs> Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient, see we that we see, so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. All right, thank you. Well, um, you know, almost every chapter is a good example but i think chapter three is a particularly good example of why a lot of christians have have difficulty with the book of hebrews because if you don't have at least a basic knowledge of the old testament and some of the particulars especially in the first five books of the bible uh you're probably going to struggle with the book of hebrews to understand what he's talking about so um we'll talk about some of that tonight hopefully you were able to to Use your your study Bible if you have one, and look up some of the cross references. If you took you into back into uh, Numbers and and uh, Deuteronomy and Exodus um, regarding some of the things that he talks about here, but it it really whenever we come to something like that in the New Testament, it's really a good opportunity to go and and get into the Old Testament a little bit and see what the history is, uh, and it it also demonstrates why. When we look at the book of Hebrews, it's really vital to step into kind of a Hebrew mindset into, as we said at the beginning, those Jewish sandals and put on the Jewish robe and kind of have the mind of a Jew, because that's predominantly who this or primarily who this was written to, even though we're going to see lots of applications for all believers. He's really making the case to the Jewish nation uh, who have heard the gospel uh, and some had received it, some had rejected it, some were on the fence about it. And so he is using a lot of rich Old Testament uh, references and uh, history in order to point them to Jesus Christ. So let's jump into that. Briefly give a few important, well, yeah, that's what we did. Briefly give a few important facts that the therefore in 3.1 refers to. And he uses 
therefore a lot in Hebrews. Uh, it's one of the things that really causes people to identify this book as being written by Paul because mm -hmm. there's similarity there with uh, the book of Romans. There are a lot of therefores in Romans uh, referring back to what he's just said. So uh, we use that, that, that kind of phrase sometimes. If you ever see a therefore in scripture or really anywhere, you need to ask what it's there for. So that's what we want to do here. We're going to do the same thing next week in chapter four. He's going to start off with a therefore. So we'll do a little recap. So what is the therefore there for this week? Give a few things that we talked about last week in chapter two. Okay. Good. Go ahead. That, that Jesus had to be fully human so that that he, he could become a merciful and, and, and faithful high priest. And the only way he human, fully human is to be resurrected. He could only be fully human if he had resurrected, if he'd actually died. Okay, good. Dennis? So he was greater than, or higher than the angels. Okay. And so therefore he's going into, he's higher than Moses. Exactly. He's making the next step. Good. Yeah, we're going to see that that series of greater thans or superior to. We've already seen greater than the prophets back in right off the begin. I mean, right off, off the bat in verses one, one and two, greater than the prophets. Then he spent the last couple chapters greater than the angels, even though for a time he was made a little lower than the angels because he was made like us. Uh, for a time in order to, as JC said, go to the cross, die for our sins, uh, be raised up so that we could be raised up. Uh, now he's going to talk about, and we'll see this in the next question in a moment, greater than Moses. And it is the next logical step, even though there you could he could he could talk about every intervening person. He could talk about Noah and he could talk about Abram and he could talk about Isaac and he could go all the way up the ladder. But he goes right to Moses and we'll see why in just a few minutes. What else from chapter two? Why is the therefore? Why is the therefore there? To pick up on anything else? Well, because Christ is tempted. He knows okay. He knows our temptations, and he's able to help us through those temptations. You know, that's such an important point, and we kind of looked ahead last week in chapter 4. We're going to see that almost identical phrase again, only it's going to add an important qualifier. Um, he's going to tell us that he is tempted in all ways, even as we are. But in chapter 4, he's going to say, yet without sin. And it's such an important fact and such an important blessing of the uh, of the Christian life that our our God stepped into human flesh and was tempted like we are so that he could be a compassionate high priest and and identify with us what it's like to be tempted um, where he doesn't identify with us is what it's like to sin because he did not sin. But he did take on our sin uh, to himself uh, in order to pay for it. And so that's another great therefore. Very good. Anything else? Jesus humbled himself to die for us. Amen. Good. You know, we brought up that Philippians 2 passage a lot last week because it's, uh, it's really, you can really see it in chapter 2, how he was making the case that uh, that Christ had, again, was made like us a little lower than the angels for a time. He did humble himself so that he could die uh, in our place. Uh, and one of the other things we saw last week in 214, that he did this in order to destroy the devil and uh, who has the power of death. Uh, and I'm going to run through the other ones just real quick so we can go on to the, the next. But if anybody has something they want to add, that's fine. Uh, 210, to bring many sons to glory. Um, 215 to release those in fear of death and bondage. Uh, and, and so what a powerful little chapter. It's a short chapter. And, and uh, many of these in Hebrews are short little chapters, compact, but it, it, it shows us how powerful uh, the Holy Spirit used the individual who wrote this uh, to to present a, a powerful but succinct case. And that's what we're, we're seeing. We've mentioned it before that this is almost like a, a legal brief uh, laying out a case to the Jewish nation using their own history and their own uh, their own scripture to demonstrate that their Savior had indeed come and that he is the only source of salvation. Very good. Anyone else want to add to any of that? Yeah, like they yes. say there, don't rebel against God, but... 
what they done to build against him. That's exactly they, right. They, they paid out there in the wilderness without going to the promised land. Very good. Yeah. And, you know, Paul will say elsewhere that uh, both in Romans and in, in First Corinthians, that all these things in the Old Testament were given for our instruction or one translation is for our learning. And the uh, Benton County translation says for our learning. Um, but, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's important to understand that he gives God doesn't whitewash things in Scripture. He shows us the failures of the Jews for their own benefit, as well as for our benefit. So we don't make the same mistakes. And he also shows the victories as well, so that we we follow in the in faithful footsteps. So we're good. Uh, so who is Jesus? Oh, no, no, I skipped one. Who are the holy brethren and partakers of the heavenly calling referred to in 3 1? So it's right off. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. I guess all of us. Okay. Well, yeah, several times he made reference to brethren in Hebrews, and we have to remember those three audiences, but this one's specific. He's talking to believers. Okay. Good. Or Jewish or not. Gentile or believers. Believers? Okay. He's taking down the petitioners between us. Good. Yeah. In, in, in who he's talking to here, it just about has, has to be Jewish believers at this point. But again, he he's Hebrews is crafted as such to address a wide audience. Even we can even take it again and apply it to even though he wasn't writing necessarily to Gentiles, he's writing to Hebrew believers, Hebrew wafflers, and Hebrew unbelievers. Uh, we can still find application here um, for Gentile believers, wafflers, and unbelievers, uh, because it's talking about the same Jesus who uh did the same thing for us that he did for them really the only difference is and again paul deals with this in the book of romans as well is that the jews had much more information they had the prophets and they had the scriptures and they had the covenants and uh, they had the testimony of angels they had so much more information that it should have been much more evident to them he sets this up here for the end of end of the chapter when he's talking about the people that that died in the wilderness and did not confess the people that wouldn't go into the land and, and died in the land, but they ended up with Lord. But and then the ones like Caleb and Josh, right? They went, they got both things. They got the rest of the land and the hill. Right. So that's the wafflers that yes <laughs> you did you have, you have every you have every group yeah. uh demonstrated in the, the, the wilderness wanderers. You're exactly right. You have ones that were gonna enter the land ones who refused uh, i mean it, it it's a it's a tragic tale and it's not just a tale i mean that makes it almost sound like it's just a fable uh it's it's a tragic moment or 40 years i should say in in israel's history where literally god <laughs> drug them to the promised land and they refused to go in and uh god cared for him even after that even though he even said i'm gonna you're gonna wander for 40, 40 years he still cared for him out in the wilderness but he said ah you will not enter my rest Is that, because of their unbelief i always have a hard time i'm a black and white person and so i always have a hard time with someone that professes to be a believer that doesn't live like me. but at one point in their life they did live like a believer. Mm -hmm. and so will they'll be like the people that for the first two years they were with Moses and they saw everything and then they spend the next 40 years wandering in the desert and the whole time they could have been living in a right relationship with the Lord right. and, and enjoying the benefits and everything that comes with trusting Christ, working out your salvation with fear and trembling right. as opposed to just being saved and then they, they give all that up just to live a life they're believers but they don't have a believer's life. Or, right. I don't have to put it the right word. Well, you have that mix. I mean, because there are some that say everybody in that that generation, if you take this to the extreme, one, one interpretation would be none of them entered any of God's rest. They didn't go to the promised land. They didn't go to heaven. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see that. Because I think you, you bring a good analogy that there are some who are believers who 
come to know Christ, but then they don't live for the Lord. Uh, they have they have little to show for Christ addresses that with the parable of the talents. Um, and it's similar here. I think some of them probably came to faith. I think a lot of them didn't because what we see all through scripture is the, the ratio in any given group, the ratio of people who come to faith and the ratio of people who don't come to faith. Uh, it's it's a smaller ratio of people that genuinely come to faith uh, than those that do. So, I was under the people. impression that from the moment they started on the journey, they were griping and murmuring. I think that's a valid. Uh, I think that's valid. Medias along the <clears throat> congregation. So the, the yeah. question would be, did the destruction, because there was literal destruction of some of the some of the rebels, they were they got the ground opened up and swallowed them up. Did the 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 actions by God, the penalty of the 40 years in the wilderness and the uh, the, the death penalty for the rebels, did that move some then to come to faith to really believe God? but they were still condemned to suffer the consequences of their sin. I think we understand that. I, we can, we can, we can um, reject, 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 finally come to a point where our life's falling apart, we accept Christ, but there's still consequences to our action. I think about people in, in prison who come to Christ in prison, but that doesn't mean you know God sends down a get out of jail free card. Yeah. And even if they do get out of jail, there's still consequences for that but there's also new opportunities there's redeemed opportunities where they can use their experiences and so forth to serve the lord so it it's it falls into the basket of unless we just take this that god was was so angry that he not only said you're not going to enter the promised land but no matter what commitment what decision you make throughout the 40 years you cannot enter my my eternal rest either that to me goes contrary to the grace and mercy of God. And so while I think a lot of, a lot of them didn't, um, I think, a, I think many of them probably came to faith during that 40 years. The conversation that God had with, with, with God in, in numbers. I mean, it, yeah. it, it demonstrates his grace and mercy. Right. Yeah. I mean, but but it also demonstrates there's a limit well, because it, God did not override himself and say, okay, I'll let no, you go ahead and go in. No, it was no. only those that were 20 years and younger yeah. and Joshua and Caleb. But the well, was right. You had the ones that went, that were able to go not only yeah. here on earth, they had the blessing. Yes. And they had the, 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 the offering of many turning to the Lord. The, like Moses, he he didn't get to enjoy the, the fruit and the land. Of, he did not get to enjoy the land that God had promised him, and he, he promised all he had promised him to it, but he didn't get to enjoy it. But yet he was spent, spent he's in heaven with the Lord. Yes, and then you have people that was willing to stone Caleb and right. You have to see it, at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes, <laughs> he did see it. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Go ahead. Sort of attitude though. Once they got, they weren't allowed into the promised land, right? Right. But didn't they have hope that they were going to get there? Well, previously they had no hope. You know? Yeah, you know, it, they're 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 an interesting group of people. I think they get a lot of heat because we do the same kind of stuff. But they did. But they also continued to grumble and they continued to to complain. And well, if they was twenty years and older, they knew they weren't going to possess the land. Right. They, they, I mean, they knew that because God made it evident to them when some did. He allowed them to die. And yeah. So it's I mean, it was, it was, so it wasn't. Yeah, it's pretty picturesque as we go through these yeah. next two chapters because their corpses fell in the wilderness. Yeah. I mean, uh, they they. They saw that whole generation. They saw their neighbors die in the wilderness and be buried along the way because uh, they, you know, God was so invested in them not seeing the earthly hope, the earthly rest, that uh, 
you know, they, he didn't wait till they got to the land to die or take, take them to the border so they could be buried in the land. They're buried out in the wilderness, and that's where their bones are still today. What's left so of them? What's a spiritual illustration, if any, here? Uh, you know, is the promised land a picture of heaven and these people have endured by faith and enter into the rest in, the, in heaven? Or is this a picture of people that are redeemed and they 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 are they have unbelief. It says, "Be be careful that there's no hard heart that comes up with unbelief in you." And you know, and, and a picture of Christians who fail to to basically be thankful and trust in God, and therefore they never realize the promises of living in God's. I mean, I'd be, I'd be interested in seeing. I'm sure there's multiple schools of thought. I, oh, there are. I don't <laughs> on, on any of them, but. As long as well, you know, I, God knows your heart, and, and, and if you if you sin, there will be consequences, right. whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, and uh, God chastens those whom he loves. So if you're sinning and you don't have any chastening, then it's a totally picture of what you're not. So I mean, what do you think, Pastor? I mean, is that what is the promised land in this illustration? Let's move on. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, because... It's the, the Hebrews is a good example of a book of the old saying that that scripture has one proper interpretation, but a multitude of applications. And there are applications here. Then the interpretation, the narrow interpretation, I think, is re, is fairly restrictive to the Jewish nation. And so he is talking to the Jewish nation about what their Jewish forefathers went through in pursuing the promise of that Jewish land, that rest that God promised. It is still, it, it, and it, it, where we're at today in biblical interpretation, it's, it's always either or. It's either literal or it's allegorical. It, it, almost everywhere in scripture, it's not either or, it's both and. And this is a both and situation. He's talking very literally that they did not go into the land. That whole generation, I mean, you can't get much more literal than their corpses dropped in the wilderness. It's, they drop, they die. The question then is, well, what does that have to do with Abraham's bosom or the uh, paradise? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a thornier question. That's what we kind of started out with. Did some of them come to faith and, and start to believe and, and really believe God once they saw things uh, progress once they saw the rebels dealt with and they saw uh, more of God's miracles and they saw the provision of the water and the manna and the uh, the quail and so forth and th we don't have a definitive answer my my lean to answer is yeah I'm sure that some did come to faith uh, because God's gracious like that but he but did not, the, the but they still did not, they, enter, still they didn't enter the earthly promised land, <laughs> but they entered the heavenly promised land. And who's a good example for that? Well, somebody mentioned it, Moses, mm -hmm. even with that one infraction, right. Moses did not enter the earthly promised land. So if we are very wooden in our interpretation of this, then we'd have to say, well, then Moses didn't get to go into the heavenly promised land either. Well, we know that's not the case. Because Jesus saw Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration. So uh, that, you know, take all of that evidence. And I think there were others that were faithless. And that's how God terms, essentially terms Moses on. It wasn't the pattern of his life, but it was that one occasion. And it kept, say again. Disobedience. Disobedience. Yeah. disobedience. Uh, it kept him out of the promised land. But but it didn't keep him out of the heavenly promised land. And I think there were others in that company that entered the heavenly promised land, but they, they certainly didn't enter the, uh, the, the earthly one. You could talk about this all night. You could you talk about it. Well, because Moses, he, he, he led these people. He saw everything that God did, he did for two years. Everything. I mean, he did miraculous things. And then he sent the spies out, 10 of the spies come back and said, no, nah, we can't do that. Okay. <laughs> it's like he gave up that's yeah so the second generation and the third generation are still that obstinate and and uh disbelieving people you know i mean the second generation made it into the promised land but they didn't make it in as believers the, you know it, it is it is the history of faith and faithlessness and there has not been and you can go research it for next week. 
There's not one completely faithful generation of the Jews, and there has not been one faith, completely faithful generation of the church. It's like the second law of spiritual faith. <laughs> it is. It's it's <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly right. Now, varying degrees. And, you know, one of my favorite illustrations, even though it's a dismal one, is uh, King Josiah. There's this great revival after just absolute debauchery. And you have Jeremiah raise up during God raises, raises Jeremiah up during Josiah's godly reign. And it says there was a, you know, Josiah held a Passover, the likes that had never been seen. And at, at the time of the writing had not been seen since and probably has not been duplicated. And they probably won't be until the kingdom comes. But it's not just the Jews. I, yeah, I, I said that. I, I said that there's not been one completely faithful Jewish generation or one completely faithful generation yeah. of the church. Yeah, it, you're exactly right. Um, and so Jeremiah got to see it at its height. But by the time Jeremiah is an old man, he saw it. He saw Jerusalem smoldering and, and burning and he's being carried away to, uh, to Egypt against his will. And the others are being carried away to Babylon. And and we see the same thing in the history of the church as well. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to mention like Nineveh. Nineveh was one of the greatest revivals there was. Maybe the biggest revival we have recorded in scripture. That's, yeah, but later example. on, Nineveh was not following God. No. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Third one of the, uh, uh, the spies that uh, had went in with the bush that uh, God said, take a seed then. The new land, yeah, two actually, yeah, two. Joshua and Caleb. Yeah, yeah. they were the, the only two spies that, that said, No, let's go get them. <laughs> well, that's why I think all this illustrates that you know, any will outside of God's will is doomed to corruption. Even, even Satan, made like the most high, all powerful. One could say he, he had obviously had a free will, and his will with all his power was still not, he was still not God. So there was not, I mean, I think in the eons of eternity future, God's going to have us look back and say, you see, yes. anything outside of me yes. is going down. Yeah, I think Stand. Spurgeon said something to the effect of uh, if you, when you have God's will, now when you make God's will your will, then you will have your will. But we get it backwards. We want to make our will God's, God's will. will. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all about lining up with God's will. And when we do that, then we're going to see the benefits of God's will, even though we have blinders on when we look at it. We can only see our own self-interest or what we want to accomplish. And I think the Jews were the same way. The, the only thing that the Jews coming out of Egypt had in mind was, hey, we're going to be delivered out of Egypt. We're going to have independence. We're going to... But they got out there and, you know, in and of themselves, they didn't know what to do with it, number one. And the, the tragedy, though, is God did, but they didn't want to trust him. Uh, and it, it, it just imagine if they would have gone into the land when God wanted to take them into the land. What a, what a, what a mighty thing that would have been. All right. We got, we chased a lot of rabbits. I mean, we're going to change that tonight. We chased a lot of groundhogs and Marty's caught more than we have. So, <laughs> all right. Um, who is Jesus compared to in two to six? We've already kind of answered this. It is Moses. What do you what do you find in that comparison between Jesus and Moses? Why, let's ask this question first. Why does he use Moses as the comparison? He's a faithful servant. Okay. Moses was faithful. He was a deliverer. He was a deliverer. Good. He was also mentioned in the law that there would be a prophet like. Moses. Moses, good. Yep. Moses had to obey. Sometimes he thought he had to do what he needed, like have his own nephew in his wife and kiss stone for disobedience, taking stuff out of Jericho. Oh. Were well, they not supposed to? Okay. Moses was the author of the five, first five books in the Torah. Okay. So he would have had a lot of authority. They see him as being authoritarian. Okay, good. And all those things are are correct. Why why use it in why pick Moses as being because what he's going to demonstrate is is not not so much that Jesus is like Moses, even though he is. And as Caleb mentioned, the the, the 
the statement in, in Deuteronomy 18 where Moses prophesies, you know, God says there's going to be a, a prophet that raises up that's like me and, and so forth. Why does he pick Moses to demonstrate that Jesus is superior to uh, He's Moses? A great hero. Okay, hero. He's the most hero of man. Okay. Points, okay. Points back to the law. Okay. Yeah. And their relationship the with the law is all direct back to Moses. The, the, the thing that, that they, they struggle with uh, when we get to the book of Acts and we look close to the book of Acts and even in the Gospels is the letter of the law. And so what he demonstrates here, and it's something that Paul does in the book of Romans as well, book of Galatians as well, is that Christ fulfilled the law. Christ is superior to the law. The law is fine. Uh, the law is given by God. It is holy and is righteous and is good. And Moses was holy and righteous and good. Uh, but Christ is superior. And God has prepared through Christ a superior path to salvation in that we're not obligated to keep a law we can never keep anyway. Christ kept it in our place and then died in our place and then was raised from the dead. And so Moses makes the only really spiritual and logical choice to uh, appeal to the Jewish nation um, and, and take Christ and show that it, it's something that, that, God, through the author of Hebrews, has to overcome to the Jews to show them that there's a superior path to him uh, than the law and uh, than Moses, and that is Jesus Christ. Very good. Others? He points out that Moses was a servant. Yes. But Christ was the son of God. The, that's such a neat few sentences there in, in, in 2 through 6, that Moses served in the house uh, and it brings Moses, you know, probably something that any any Jew would be loath to do with other Jews is when we came in, Andy was talking to somebody and you were talking about Appalachian and Appalachian. Uh, you know, it's the kind of that kind of mentality. You don't say Appalachian to an Appalachian uh, <laughs> without maybe getting a gun pointed at you. Uh, and, and so it's the same kind of thing. You don't dog on Moses. You don't pull Moses down. Um, but Moses, what he does in a very kind of subtle way, he says, look, Moses was a servant in God's sense. He wasn't the son of God. He wasn't God in flesh. Uh, he was a servant in God's house. He said he's a faithful servant. Uh, he's a faithful servant, but nonetheless, he's a servant in God's house. But Christ, it's his house by right of uh, inheritance. Uh, he is the son of God, and when it gets down to it, he is God himself. So he doesn't even go through the whole right of inheritance thing. He just says that Christ is the master of the house. And, and that's just brilliant. You know, it's, it's just brilliant re reasoning from a logical perspective as well as from a spiritual perspective. Very good. Others? Comments or questions? Okay, what in verses four to six, what uh, keeping on that that idea of the house, what is the evidence that they and we were and are part of uh, the son's house? So that kind of connects back to that first uh, statement, holy brethren, he's talking to those that that are in uh, God's house or part of God's house. How, what's the evidence that we're part of God's house, Christ's house, which we could say more specifically. And I, and I just love that Christ uses that same imagery in, in John 14. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, and he talks about in my father's house are many dwelling places and that whole idea of, of house and, and home and uh, abiding together is, is rich throughout uh, the, the Gospels and, and uh, in the New Testament. What evidence do you see? It's the Christ faithfulness. Okay, good. Uh, verse six, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to uh, the, the confidence that are in, in the rejoicing. Born JC, I'm not doing any better. And the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So just because we're in Christ, uh, there's a fundamental uh, uh, 
argument to be made. Caleb's talked about it in Romans that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's his house because we're in him. It's our house as well. We're in the same house. Good. What else? Anything else? What does it mean? And I know I didn't ask you this specifically, but what is what does it mean that that if there, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what does that mean? What does that if mean? Is doggone ifs? I think it's the same thing that 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 Joshua and Caleb would say to the Trinity. They held fast. Okay. And, and because of that, that they re, they reap the reward of their faithfulness um, to the end, as opposed to not being. Uh, I don't want what the right word would be. Uh, oftentimes, I'll, I'll use myself. Oftentimes, I'm not secure in the fact that God's going to be faithful. I sometimes doubt that because, okay. well, how could I deserve such a thing? Mm -hmm. And or why I'd have to be obedient 100 percent of the time to receive that and um i think the, the, the faithfulness is what the faithfulness of moses the faithfulness of christ um is is what i don't can is we hold fast that we have confidence um you know it says uh, that if we don't if we ask if we ask without wavering if we ask without doubt um we receive but if we Ask with well, even if we ask James with one, them, yeah. then it's like you know, surf on the sea you're talking about. So. Okay, Dennis, I saw you with your hand up. The word since, okay, the if since, okay, uh, we can we employ that whose house we are since we hold fast. It's a, go ahead, Marty. Well, I was just going to say, you know, he talked about holy brother in. The first verse. So he's talking about true believers. And I think that's what that's pointing to in my and the way I look at it. Whose house we are, if we are true believers and confident in the boast of our hope firm until the end. Okay. Um, Good. You have a lot of people that profess to be believers that really aren't true believers. And those people, in my opinion, are the, are the ones who are the first to waver, first to question God. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Uh, I'm okay. Confused. Nope. Good. Well, we talked about this in the youth group recently. It's not an issue of security. It's an right. issue of assurance. So it's a proof of your salvation when you're confident. Um whether you're secure or not is if you trust Christ as your savior and that's in his hands, but we can sometimes lose our assurance because our walk is not faithful and right. we're not confident. And exactly. the, that's exactly what that. I got to tell my wife. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're arguing about this for two hours. Well, <laughs> well I want to get in the middle of that. <laughs> hey, you're all right. You're going to be gone. <laughs> I'll give you his number so you can call him on yeah. vacation. <laughs> hey, explain this to her, would you? <laughs> Assurance versus security. Security is in the Lord's hand. You know, yeah. when we are safe, we are secure, but we're not always as sure of it because we fail. Yeah. yeah. And so sure. the assurance yeah. is on is on our end. Yeah. The 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 theological title for this is the perseverance of the saints. And it just means that, as Caleb just said, our security is wrapped up in Christ. We don't do anything to keep ourselves secure. We can't. We don't, it, no more than we can earn it. That's exactly right. We can't earn it. We can't secure it. That's all in God's sovereign hand. Uh, but we have a responsibility to be faithful. And our faithfulness is a proof. And I, I always like that word in this conversation. It's a proof of our, our faith. And it goes back to what Marty said, that it, it separates out those that have made, that are professors or professing of the faith and those who are possessors of the faith. And that is a, a it's a, an important difference. You, you should be both a professor and a possessor, but some only profess their faith, but they've never possessed it. They've never taken that leaf. And 
that's where the the company wandering through the wilderness for 40 years is a good example because i think there were many that at at some point did finally make that leap because they, they said my goodness look at all the all the proof and it's the very thing he's pointing to here and that james points to and uh that and elsewhere uh, paul does in romans points to all the proof and so that proof moves people um and then the spirit does the rest but there are others that are just not going to be moved uh you know we say i shall not be i shall not be moved uh, you know, you can sing that as a Christian and it's rich with meaning, but you can sing it as an agnostic or an atheist or or one that possesses uh, possesses the name Christian, but has never uh, possessed the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's uh, it's a it's a bad thing to not be moved. Um, so, yeah, it's about uh, it, it's about. Uh, consistently having fruit in your life, consistently uh, having proof in your life, uh, even to the end of your life. And we have good examples in scripture, don't we? I mean, Stephen, we just looked at in the book of Acts, uh, talking about being faithful to the end, a horrible death, but is his eyes were on Jesus Christ, which we're going to see that here in Hebrew. Now, it makes me wonder sometimes, did the author of Hebrews, was he acquainted with Stephen? And when you get to Romans or Hebrews 12, and he says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Um, that sounds like Stephen to me, and it should sound like each one of us, no matter how difficult things get, how much persecution we might endure, uh, or if we endure little persecution, it doesn't matter. Our eyes should always be fixed on Jesus Christ. So that's in the four... Um, my word warnings <laughs> four warnings that he gives you always have a a statement that some take and misconstrue to uh we can lose our salvation and this is one of them you can if you don't remain faithful till the end you're going to lose your salvation uh and it's it's looking at the problem wrong or looking at the statement wrong it's not a matter if if you don't remain faithful till the end you'll lose your salvation if you don't remain faithful to the end you never had salvation in the first place right. because we are we're, believers are going to remain faithful uh, until the Lord takes us home. Good. Um, verse, I don't have a good distinction on my, the vital warning is given. Nope. Verse seven begins with another. Therefore, what's it there for? And what scripture is quoted and why? But we don't have the Holy We don't no no no. Uh oh. We don't what? have the author of this. We don't have the author of the book. Of Jeopardy this. says it's Paul. Yes. <laughs> sure. The, 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 the author is even right here in verse seven. The, the, he's he's emphasizing again. We may not know who the author is, but the author is the yes. Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Good. And he quotes here Psalm ninety-five seven through eleven, which is. Uh, a, a, a psalm to everybody, but it's specifically, you know, of great import to the Jews because it is recounting the to about those wilderness wanderers again. So uh he 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 lays out the case that he's going to talk more about these these wilderness wanderers, which he's just beginning to talk about. We started talking about it early in the conversation and we got the whole chapter out of whack here. So now is where he begins to talk about, yeah, that's a good theological term, uh, out of whack. Um, this is where he begins to talk about the wilderness wanderers, even though we talked about them much more earlier. Uh, he brings this into the equation, and he does it for the purpose of showing that those who are uh, genuine believers are going to remain faithful, and those who are not are not. And some of them clearly were not and were destroyed. They were they were they were killed um, by God. They were. Uh, judged directly by God and others uh, suffered the consequences of not entering into the promised land rest. Wait, you asked the question later about excuse me, but I was when when it says today you hear his voice yes. and, it, and, and it made me think of 6 1 uh, 2 Corinthians 6 1 and 2 yeah. it says, and working together with him we also mm -hmm. urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain for he said at the acceptable time I listen to you and on the day of salvation I helped you and it's, it's, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. When you hear it, that's the day. I mean, and that's when you need to act. Um, 
don't, don't harden your hearts. <laughs> Anyway. Exactly. And that, you know, in JC fashion, he skipped over three questions and now we're down at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but he wants to get right to the point. And, uh, and it is an important well, think, point. Yeah. Because he's already mentioned today. So I, it's valid to bring it up here. And I did ask a question later on that the word today is used to stress a point in chapter three. How many times is it used? Does anybody get that? Three, three times. times. Three times he uses it. And JC's hit the nail on the head as to why it's important. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, just what JC mentioned. Isaiah says it to the Jews in Isaiah 49, 8. Uh, makes it clear that, you know, there's no better time. And we talk about it when we share the gospel. You don't know it, it, that you're going to leave today and you're going to have another breath. Uh, JC mentioned the book of James earlier. What does James say? Our life is a vapor. That wasn't just true then. It's it's true now. Um, you know, we could, we could be gone tonight. Uh, we could be gone in the rapture tonight. Uh, and so for believers, even we're supposed to consider the brevity of life and what we're doing for the Lord. And, uh, and are we being faithful in, uh, in our affiliation with him and our service to him? Uh, but I think he's really targeting here those Jews who have who are sitting on the fence or who have just outright said, no, uh, we're not going to we're not going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's someone else or, or he hasn't come yet or what have you. He says, look, today you got to hear the voice and don't harden your heart. Let's go down to verse 15 as in the rebellion. Why? Because those corpses fell in the wilderness. There are serious consequences to disregarding the word and the voice of God. Uh, so if we go back up a question, does anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions on that? What vital warning is given to the recipients of the epistle and to us in, in 12 to 15? Kind of just talked about those, but if anybody's got anything to add, you can you can do that. Don't allow your heart to be hardened. Don't be hardened. You know, a hardened heart is one of the most dangerous things that we can possess. And that goes for both believers. For believers and unbelievers. That's exactly right. If we have a hardened heart, uh, we we are going to miss uh, we are going to miss what God has for us, and it can take us to an eternity apart from God if you don't know Christ, and it can cause us to miss a great deal of blessings. We uh, spend four years missing blessings. That's right. We can. That's exactly right. Uh, what important points are stressed to these Hebrews in three sixteen through nineteen? <clears throat> As he closes out this little this little chapter, what are some of the important things that he stresses? When you hear, obey. Good, yeah, and we we've really talked about a lot of these again because we we spent a lot of time on this at, at the beginning. But it, it nineteen is such a powerful summary, and that goes to the very last question. Um, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And again, this is, again, what I think I always just, this has been good to study the book of Hebrews again. I always think it's a marvelous book and uh, I avoided it for a lot of years as a Christian, but once it, it began to make sense to me, um, it's just profound because it this has application for all three of those groups. If you don't know Christ, it tells you why you will not enter into God's eternal home because of unbelief. If you, and it says the same to those that are on the fence, uh, because you can't halfway believe. And the people on the fence, especially these Jews, they say, well, we're Jews. So we have that going for us, but that's not enough. Uh, you've got to believe. And for believers who we can say, well, we have faith. We've come to Christ. I've come to Christ. I already have faith. You can't have enough faith. We have to live by faith every day. We have to walk by faith. We have to, and our faith has to produce good works in us. And that's James's point. James wasn't given an either or. It's it's either faith or works. It's that faith is supposed to produce uh, righteousness or supposed to produce the proof that Caleb talked about earlier. Supposed to produce good works. And so why, why do we not enter in? Because of unbelief. Why do we not enter into day-to-day -day blessings in the Christian life? Well, it's usually because of unbelief. 
uh, because we could say disobedience, but why do we disobey? Because we don't believe. <laughs> we disobey because we don't believe there are consequences to our unbelief, or we don't. We disobey because we don't believe God is really going to do what He says He's going to do. I talked about this Sunday. You know, wives would say, "Well, I'm not going to. I don't believe in submitting to my husband because they don't believe that God has an order of of, of authority and an order of accountability." And, or husbands, I, I don't value my wife because I'm the boss and I don't have to, and we d disbelieve God. Uh, and so it comes down to unbelief. And we need to be like one of the most profound things that the, the apostles said, and I don't know how much they really mean it, but Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> we need to be saying that every day and we need to be serious about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a stern warning here, too, in sure. verse 15. You got uh, it. We can provoke God. God is, is full of grace. He's full of love, and he's full of mercy. And he loves us uh, unequivocally, but we can provoke him. And we can be punished for our sin. And we are punished for our sin. I mean, it's not. Will he? Uh, yeah, he will in his way and in his time. We can't be so uh, foolish to think that we can get by with uh, <clears throat> sin in our lives without drawing some kind of uh, discipline. discipline. Okay, he, and I'm he, not going to say punishment. And he, he's going to talk about that. I mean, when we get to the end of the book, in, in chapter 12, I mean, he talks about God disciplining us, but he does it as a father loves his son and disciplines him. I mean, so as a matter of fact, he, yeah, he, he turns it around and says, of course God disciplines us. What father does who loves his son doesn't discipline him? Well, you can, we can see how far our culture turned on its ear and, and you know, forget the culture because the culture is going to do lost things, but how Christians have turned it on its ear and, and uh, you know, God God loves us and he disciplines us out of that love. We should should love our children enough to discipline them. Think of where Israel would be today if they had obeyed oh. God and driven out all of the unbelievers oh, and all of the heathen out of, out of the promised land. We wouldn't be seeing we, we, we could say that all through scripture. And again, we could say it all through Just think Christian history. And, and we said, exactly where I'm going. We could do the same in our own life. I mean, where would we be if we would uh, if we would believe every day? We see it. We see. It's kind of hard to explain. So I'll do my best. I see a little bit of this. Well, we see a lot of this in Christ's coming. That you can't have a you can't have a kingdom without a king, and you can't have a king without a kingdom. But he can came to establish the kingdom first in our hearts. And I, I, I just, my mind kind of does little explosions. When you think about the millennial kingdom, we're all going in with Christ as the ruler in our heart. It's not like, you know, you have a king of a, of a nation now where half the people don't like him or half the people do we're, we're all, everyone. everyone, he's Lord of their heart, at least at the beginning. For a short time. Yeah. And and it's just, that is rest. It is rest. That, I mean, to anchor my soul in the haven of rest. I mean, I just think about that song to this passage and just, when you when you trust him as your savior, he brings that rest. And, and as JC said, just I can't imagine what the mm -hmm. nation would have been if they would have just allow that to happen in their heart. Amen. All right. Well, we were kind of all over the place on the questions. Is there something you wanted to discuss? So we do have a few more minutes. Uh, or had a you had a comment or question you wanted to make on a, any anything through the whole chapter? We can go back anywhere. Or did you find any practical applications in this week's passage? Well, Lord, brothers and sisters, to Jesus, those of us who are believers. Amen. That's right. Good. Anyone else? 
my two big practical applications are the urgency of evangelism, which I think just comes through because he's ple he's he's pleading with these Jews. In particular, look at all we've seen, not just recently, but throughout our whole past and how it all is fulfilled in Christ. How can you miss it? And if you do miss it, there's nowhere else to turn. You can't turn back to the law. I think I think his big frustration that comes through oftentimes is those that made a profession of faith. Now they want to go back to the law and they want to depend upon the law. He says, you can't go back. There's no going back. Um, and, and so it, for them, I think it's, it's particular, it, it's it particularly poignant. I think we can have that same thing in our own experiences as, as non-Jews when somebody walks away from a, from a cult or, or even walks away just from atheism or from, 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 uh, from uh, just being in the world. And then they want to go back to that. As, There's no going back. I mean, this is the only place. There's, you know, if you imagine that there's only one place that you can find complete satisfaction, only one place that you can find salvation, why would you go anywhere else? And that's, it sounds a little advertising-ish, but that's what he's saying. Why, why would you go anywhere else? There's no place else to go. Uh, this is it. And then the importance of faith alone in salvation, really, again, that, that 19th verse is just so powerful, I think, no matter what situation you're in, whether you don't know Christ or whether you do, the importance of, of faith, and the, as Marty pointed out, the, uh, the consequences of unbelief, even for believers in our day-to-day -day life, are, are too steep. Anyone else? Excuse me. Well, we just had his sinlessness in the previous chapter, and then he hits high on a lot on the 40 years of the wilderness. And then I think there's no, it's not a coincidence that Jesus, yeah. when he went into the wilderness for 40 days, and a lot of their strife was over hunger, and he fasted, and yet was without sin. And there's just, there's, there's no comparison between the two. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyone else? All right. Well, we will take on chapter four next week, another short chapter, and we will look at the whole chapter. So be sure to try to read it at least once all the way through before you sit down and work on the questions. And we'll be back here again uh, next Tuesday. So, um, CJ, pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come here and learn about you, Lord. I pray that you'd be with each of these men and women as we travel home tonight, Lord, that you keep, would keep them safe and healthy. And pray that you'd be with all the prayer requests tonight, Lord, for the sickness and for the needs for salvation, Lord, so that you would just work in their heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. 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 Y